Hi everybody, this is Professor Paul Hicks talking about philosophy again. Today we're going to talk about the Phaedo. This is one of the dialogues of Plato where it shows Socrates after having been sentenced to death, um, after refusing to escape in the Credo, we now find the Phaedo. And in the Phaedo we're going to focus uh, the arguments for the immortality of the soul and how is it the philosopher is supposed to relate to death itself. Um, you can really break down the Phaedo in five different parts. First, there's an initial discussion of the philosopher and death. Two, there's three arguments which are going to be proposed uh, for the immortality of the soul. Some objections, to three, the some objections to these arguments from Socrates as interlocutors uh, and his response, which includes, of course, a fourth argument. Uh, they'll talk about a myth about the afterlife, and then there's going to be a description of Socrates' final moments, uh, where at the end of the Phaedo, uh, Socrates takes the poison hemlock and dies. So we'll talk about that at the end. Um, all right. So Socrates' uh, friends learn that the annual Athenian religious mission will be back, and that Socrates will die once the elders of the community get back. And they're, they're going to be back today, so Socrates will die today. They go into the prison. They find Socrates with his wife and their baby. They send the wife and baby away. Socrates uh, is rubbing the place on his leg where he just removed the bonds that have been. He remarks on how strange it is that a man cannot have both pleasure and pain at the same time. Yet when he pursues and catches one, he is sure to meet the other as well, he says. Uh, according to Socrates, philosophers look forward to death. He thinks philosophers should be prepared to follow Socrates in death. He doesn't have a high opinion of the many. This is seen certainly in the Credo and the Apology. Um, and he, he, he argues that the philosopher is always practicing for death. That's because we want to actually get into the, the uh, realm of ideas. So one of the um, other characters in the Phaedo, this guy Cebes, asks why philosophers just don't kill themselves. And if philosophers really are seeking death, why not just commit suicide and die? Well, here's some reasons that Socrates actually gives for why we shouldn't do that. Number one, the gods are our guardians, and we are the possession of God. So if we committed suicide, we would actually be going against God. Uh, and we don't want to do that. Um, so then Socrates goes on to defend the thesis, the one aim of those who practice philosophy in the proper manner is to practice for dying and death. So let's think about what is death. Death is just the, the separation between the body and the soul. And he gets everybody to agree to this. So why is it that philosophers therefore should be prepared for death? Well, one, the true philosopher despises bodily pleasures such as food, drink, and sex. So he is more than anyone else wants to free himself from the body. I mean, just think of what we must do in order to keep the body going. Uh, you are obsessed with maybe good food, getting drunk, maybe something like that, uh, having fine wine. You're obsessed with sex. These are all bodily pleasures, and they take away from the intellectual life. And so the philosopher is interested in the intellectual life, and in order to do that, you have to get away from the body. So you want to separate yourself from the body. And since what you are is a soul, it only stands to reason that if death is the separation of soul and body, you're looking for death because you want to separate from your body. Um, Socrates talks a little bit here about the realm of the forms. Uh, the realm of the forms, real simply, is supposed to be the true nature of reality. Uh, the physical realm is really just like some sort of like shadow of what's actually real uh, in the realm of the forms, the realm of the ideas. Um, and that's where all knowledge is. That's where all wisdom is. And so, of course, according to Socrates, that's where you want to be if you're, in fact, a philosopher. So um, he's already established, he thinks, that the body is an impediment to philosophers in their search for truth. He says, quote, it fills us with wants, desires, fears, all sorts of illusions and much nonsense, so that as it is said in truth and in fact, no thought of any kind ever comes to us from the body. So if we're really interested in thoughts and the great thoughts, 
The body's not going to provide that for us, only the intellect will, and that is we get out of the soul. So to have pure knowledge, philosophers need to escape the influence of the body as much as they possibly can. Uh, so philosophy itself is a training for dying. It's a purification uh, of the philosopher's soul. It would be unreasonable, he says, for the philosopher to fear death. This is because upon dying, he'll likely obtain all of the wisdom which he spent his entire life trying to obtain. So why would the philosopher fear it? You're going to know the true nature of reality. You've been you know, Our entire lives as philosophers, we've been focused on trying to get that. right? Is there a God after death? Well, how do we find out? You have to die. So only through death do we get complete wisdom, and the philosopher wants complete wisdom. Um, notice, though, remember, the ordinary people, the many, they're not like philosophers. Philosophers will have courage in the face of death. Philosophers will learn to moderate the bodily pleasures when they seek wisdom. These are all virtues, according to Plato. These virtues are all important to the Athenians. Now, this is, of course, in stark contrast to ordinary people. Ordinary people are only brave in regard to some things because they fear even worse things happening and only moderate in relation to some pleasures because they want to be immoderate with respect to others. So ordinary people have this illusion of virtue where he says moderation and courage and justice are purging away of all such things and wisdom itself is a kind of cleansing or purification. And since Socrates accounts counts himself among philosophers, the philosophers, why wouldn't he be prepared to meet death? Thus ends a defense. So let me give you three arguments for the immortality of the soul. The first one we're going to call the cyclical argument. In it, Socrates mentions a pretty ancient theory, holding that just as the souls of the dead in the underworld come from those living in the world, the living souls come back from those of the dead. So we can reconstruct it as follows. One, all things come to be from their opposite states. For example, he says, something can only become larger if it was first smaller. Right? The opposites. It became larger, but it was originally smaller. Between every pair of opposite states, there are two opposite processes. For example, between the pair of smaller and larger, there's going to be the process of increasing or decreasing. Now, if the two opposite processes did not balance each other out, what would happen? Everything would eventually be in the same state. So, for example, if increase did not balance out decrease, everything would do what? If increase didn't balance out decrease, everything's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, since being alive and being dead are opposite states, and dying and coming to life are the two opposite processes between these states, coming to life must therefore balance out dying. Therefore, according to Socrates, everything that dies must come back to life again. All right, there's the cyclical argument. Let me get you into the argument from recollection. Um, in the Mino, uh, we uh, in the Mino, which is another dialogue uh, of uh, Plato, Socrates discusses how learning is really recollection. That is, we uh, we don't actually learn anything. Before we were born, he says, our soul already existed, right? Our soul already existed. The soul is in the realm of the forms. But then we are instantiated into this physical realm, and our soul loses all knowledge. Now, when we learn something, we're not actually learning something new. We're just remembering it, or as he says, we recollect it. We just remember it, right? Because we knew everything before we were actually born. So... Um, Socrates explains that recollection occurs when a man sees or hears or in some other way perceives one thing and not only knows that that thing, but also thinks of another thing of which the knowledge is not the same but different. So, for example, when a lover sees his beloved's uh, liar, the image of his beloved comes into mind as well, even though the liar and the beloved are two distinct things. One brings about the other. So we can reconstruct this argument as follows. Things in the world which appear to be equal in measurement are in fact deficient in the equality they possess. Two, therefore, they are not the same as true equality. That is, they're not equal itself. 
three, when we see the deficiency of the examples of equality, it helps us to think of or recollect what it is to be equal. But in order to do this, four, we must have some prior knowledge of the equal itself. Since five, since this knowledge does not come from sense perception, we must have acquired it before we acquired sense perception. That is, we must have gotten it before we were actually born. Therefore, our souls must have existed before we were born. All knowledge is what we're going to call innate. All knowledge is innate. You're born with it. And you just have to figure it out through good reasoning. All right. Um, let's move on to the next argument, which we're going to call the affinity argument. All right. The, let's think of it this way. So what, is it, what does it mean to have a, an affinity towards something? That is, you have some sort of likeness towards it. Um, so the soul has a likeness he says, to a higher level of reality, that is, the forms. So there seems to be two kinds of existences, according to Socrates. One, the visible world that we perceive with our senses, which is the human, mortal, composite, unintelligible, and always changing. Then there is an opposite, where you have an invisible realm of the forms, where we can access solely with our minds, which is divine, deathless, intelligible, non-composite, and always the same. It's the exact opposite of what the physical realm would be. Now, is the soul more like the physical realm, or is the soul more like the non-physical realm? It seems to us, when you think about it, that you have this physical body. Well, the physical body then depends upon the physical world. But there's another part to you. That is, you're a soul, you're a spirit, you're a mind. Call it whatever you want. Socrates uses the word soul. But... Your soul is not like your body. Your soul doesn't, I mean, when you just introspect on yourself and think about your spirit or soul, your mind, um, it doesn't seem to be physical. It seems to be non-physical. And so the body is the opposite of the mind or the soul. The body is in the physical realm. Therefore, the soul must be in another realm, which is non-physical. That would be the realm of the forms. Um, all right. So since the body is like one world and the soul is like the other, it would be strange to think that even though the body lasts for some time after a person's death, that the soul immediately dissolves and exists no further. So given the respective of affinities of the body and soul, Socrates spends the rest of the argument, expanding on the earlier point from his defense, that philosophers should focus on the latter. All right. Um, I want to go ahead and give you one more argument. This will be the final argument for the immortality of the soul. It goes like this. Number one, nothing can become its opposite while still being itself. It either flees away or is destroyed at the approach of its opposite. So, for example, tallness cannot become shortness while, while still being tall. This is not only true of opposites, but in a similar way of things that contain opposites. So, for example, fire and snow. They're not themselves opposites, but fire always brings hot. Snow always brings cold with it. So fire will not become cold unless it ceases to be fire. Nor will snow become hot unless it ceases to be snow. Well, the soul always brings life with it. Therefore, soul will never admit the opposite of life, that is death, without ceasing to be soul. But what does not admit death is also indestructible, Therefore, the soul is indestructible. All right. So those are the arguments for the immortality of the soul. Um, see if you like them. Try to challenge yourself to see if there's any sort of uh, responses that can be given to this. Um, the Phaedo, after we talk about the immortality of the soul, here we find out about how Socrates actually dies in Socrates' last moments. After Socrates talks about the tale of the afterlife, he says that it's time for him to prepare to take the poison hemlock, which is required for his death sentence. Socrates died by drinking poison hemlock. That was the way that the death penalty was done back then. All right. So Credo happens to be there, and Credo asks him what his final instructions are for his burial. Socrates reminds that what will remain with him after death is not Socrates himself, but rather just his body, and he says, you can bury it and do whatever you want with it. Uh, next, he wants to take a bath. And he does this so that his corpse will not have to be cleaned post-mortem. And says farewell to his wife and three sons. Now, even the officer sent to carry out Socrates' punishment is moved to tears at this point and describes Socrates as, quote, the noblest, gentlest, and the best man 
who has ever been at the prison. Credo tells Socrates that some condemned men put off taking the poison for as long as they can in order to enjoy the last moments of their life, which is feasting and sex. Um, Socrates, of course, however, asks for the poison just to be brought immediately. He drinks it calmly and in good cheer. He chastises his friends for their weeping. So his friends start crying, and he starts to say, you're acting like a bunch of women. Stop it. You're men. Don't cry. Get over it. This is not a horrible thing which is happening. Um, so his legs begin, he says, to feel heavy. He lies down. The numbness in his body travels upward until it eventually reaches his heart. Uh, and it kills him. And that's what happened to Socrates. Uh, his last words, according to the, the Phaedo, is he tells, talks to Credo. He says, Credo, I owe Acephalus a cock. Make this offering to him and do not forget. And that is the end. So what was happening at the death? He was still concerned about being just to somebody else. Justice was so important to Socrates. It meant everything to him. He sacrificed his life just to be a just person. He cared about justice, and that's what's valuable. All right, so that's the Fido in a nutshell. Um, hope you enjoyed it. And some pretty interesting arguments for the immortality of the soul. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Just email me, and I will look forward to hearing from you soon. All right, have a good day, guys. Bye.